Welcome back to On the Move with Victor Xi. This is Victor Xi. It is Monday, July 3rd. Last week, President Biden put it best when he said that we do not have a normal Supreme Court. Within the span of one year, the Supreme Court overturned a nearly 50-year-old precedent guaranteeing the right to an abortion, struck down the use of race-based affirmative action, allowed businesses to refuse to serve members of a protected class, and gutted President Biden's student loan forgiveness program. There is a lot to unpack, and I have the perfect guest with me to make sense of this court and the implications of their rulings. And she is the amazing Dahlia Lithwick, senior editor at Slate, as well as the author of a great book called Lady Justice, Woman, the Law, and the Battle to Save America. And she's also the host of the Amicus podcast. Dahlia, it is so great to see you. Thank you so much for joining me today. Oh, thank you for having me. And thank you for all the work you're doing, Victor. Like, really. <laughs> Thank you. Well, th right back at you. And, and I know there's so much to kind of break down with the Supreme Court. And I want to start with the 303 creative case, because there's a lot online about how this case was constructed basically on a fabrication. First, walk us through the reporting and what's out there so far. Uh, I mean, this is a case, it, it's it's a little tricky, because the thing that came out last week in the New Republic, which is that... Um, the case was sort of rooted in a fraud, probably wouldn't have affected the outcome of the case, but it tells us a lot about the group that brought the case. So maybe I'll start by saying this was an entirely speculative hypothetical case that was brought by a woman by the name of Lori Smith, who is a website designer in Colorado. Colorado is one of the many, many states that has what's called a public accommodations law. And that's a set of laws that say, if you hang out a shingle, if you open a business, you may not discriminate against all the protected classes that you can't discriminate against. And if this sounds familiar, this goes back to the 60s, right? This goes back to the cases Ollie's Barbecue and other cases that where people said, we will not serve um, uh, African-Americans. So fast forward to a couple of years ago, and folks may recall that we had a cake baker in a case called Masterpiece Cake Shop, also out of Colorado, and he was not prepared to bake a cake for same-sex marriages. He was like, I will absolutely uh, offer services to all comers, just not these two guys because they want to get married to each other and my religion prohibits it. Mm -hmm. And the Supreme Court and Masterpiece Cake Shop kicked that case away, right? Was just kind of like, oh, that seems kind of bad. And the Colorado Civil Rights Commission said some stuff that hurt his feelings. But they didn't decide the case on the merits. This week, <laughs> they decided essentially the same case on the merits about the web designer. And we'll talk about in a second what they decided. But the essential thing to understand is the only thing that changes is the composition of the court. The Justice Anthony Kennedy, who always had immense solicitude and respect for LGBTQ plus uh, uh, dignity and respect and integrity, is gone and has been replaced by Neil Gorsuch, Brett Kavanaugh, Amy Coney Barrett. And so in this opinion, by a six to three margin with all new justices, the court essentially decided, um, hey, you have a right, even if you hang out a shingle and awful, offer service to all comers, you have a right to discriminate if you don't like uh, what it is that uh, these couples are seeking. And the piece of it that you're asking about is Lori Smith had never designed a wedding website. She had never refused service to a couple. She had never, ever, ever done anything that would have resulted in her harm. So this case is entirely based on her hypothetical hurt feelings if the Colorado uh, anti-discrimination law had eventually tagged her. So if I can ask you something that maybe like people who don't follow the Supreme Court might not know about, I mean, in terms of hypotheticals like this one, how often is it that the court engages in and rules on hypotheticals? And what does it take to even bring a case to the Supreme Court? Yeah, I mean, the Constitution pretty much says there has to be some injury. There has to be some harm. You have to have some standing to come to the court. And the standing can't be, I don't want to feel sad uh, when I'm dinged for violating the state public accommodation law. And so you're exactly right. The long, long history of kind of cabining reckless lawsuit begins and ends with the proposition that something has to have happened that can be redressed, and then the court can jump in. 
reason. So this is radical in that sense. It slightly gets to your question about the reporting in the New Republic, because one of the things that came up in this case, as it turned out, was that while Lori Smith was never asked uh, to make a website for anyone. She did use as evidence a letter of inquiry, an email that had come to her, she said, from a guy called Stuart, who wanted her to make a wedding website for himself and his husband. A very enterprising reporter at the New Republic called Stuart last week. Apparently nobody had done so and said, so what's up? Uh, I guess you're the guy. And he's like, well, I'm married to a woman. I've been married for many years. I have a kid. Uh, I had nothing to do with this. And so under the hypothetical, there seems to be at least the suggestion that ADL, the group that was kind of ringleading this suit, manufactured a fake uh, a person to send a fake email that triggers this whole lawsuit. And this stays wow. in the case. It do, it's not the basis of the decision, to be clear, but it stays in the case throughout. And it raises real questions about whether this whole thing was kind of cooked up in an underground lab to be wow. an injury where no injury, in fact, occurred. Uh, I think Sherilyn Eiffel said it best that there's this new legal doctrine that seems to come out of this case, which is like the I worry legal doctrine. And, and I'm wondering, I mean, given that, is there anything that can happen now to look further into this? Anything that the Department of Justice, Congress, anything that can happen, um, given what we know about the case right now? I mean, Victor, you're seeing the same tweets I am about people calling for congressional hearings and people saying that the Justice Department should probe this. My guess is they won't. As I said, it doesn't turn on, you know, the case itself doesn't rely on uh, Stewart and the email that he sent. And so in some sense, it's, you know, we can have a conversation about disciplining ADL. I'm sure somebody is going to say, and even the New Republic article said, maybe this was an error that nobody caught. It's going to be hard to show actual bad faith. But I think the thing I want to say about this case, and this is really important, is if we go back to Loving versus Virginia, right, the case that said you can't uh, have laws that say uh, interracial marriage is prohibited. You go back to Brown v. Board. You go back to every case. The reason there has to be an actual harm is so there's another party in the case, right? Yeah. So when the baker in Masterpiece Cake Shop a few years ago denied service to a same-sex couple, those people had names, they had faces, they had stories, they had a mom. All that was fleshed out in the case, right? We knew the other side. Because there's no other side in this case, nobody's been harmed. The only story that comes to the Supreme Court is the story of this beleaguered web designer who just thinks that same-sex marriages are, to use her words, false marriages, and she can't support them. So I just want to sort of lift up, because Sherilyn's making this point too, it's not just that there's a falsity at the heart of this, it's that if you allow parties to come into your court with no injury, you will hear one side of the story, and the whole nature of the legal system is supposed to be that we're supposed to test two truths against one another. What does kind of what we know about this entire situation suggest to you about the current state of the court that it even got to this point that it ruled on this, you know, in this case? How do, what do you make of kind of this broader composition of the court now? I mean, you know, we're having a huge fight now trying to understand what it means that we have a 6-3 supermajority at the court, right? This is not the court in which, as I said, Anthony Kennedy was the decider for many years. Sandra Day O'Connor was the decider. For a while, John Roberts was the decider. And even though he was a movement conservative, at least he was principled. Uh, now we have not just five, but often six votes. And that's what we saw in all three cases you ticked off, right? In affirmative action, in doing away with debt relief, and in 303 Creative, six to three wouldn't have mattered what John Roberts did because it's over before it's over. And that's really new. It is, by every metric, the most conservative Supreme Court we've seen in a century. And I think that it matters because when the court takes a case like this, that, as we said, is not ripe, is not, there's no injury, there's no standing, there's no party. And the court signals, like, we're opening the doors to all comers. Anybody who has a grievance, anybody who in this great, vast game of constitutional feelings ball that we now live in has been hurt, mm -hmm. can come, and that they can have that injury redressed, even though it's hypothetical, that's the real fear. And we've seen that in case after case after case this year. There's no actual harm happening here. What there is is 
an invitation from the court to bring us your buckets and pails of grievance and, and sadness, hopefully centering, you know, white, wealthy businesses, and we will fix it for you. And that's the world we live in right now. And that's the world I suspect we're going to live in for the foreseeable future. It's terrifying. And one of the things I've been seeing on Twitter a lot from particular legal commentators is the thing kind of a 333 court. Um, the fact that there are like three liberal justices, three Republican justices, and three kind of institutionalists rather than a 6 3 court. What do you make of that argument? I know you have a recent piece in Slate that talks about that. And there was a great piece by Steve Vladek um, this morning of kind of their argument that's a 333 court, that it's not as partisan as we're making it out to be. Yeah, yeah, this became kind of a cool thing to say uh, when Amy Coney Barrett first came on the court and people were like, hey, look, you know, Justice Kavanaugh and Justice Barrett and Justice Roberts are sort of modulating the MAGA crazy. So they're clearly at the center of the court. And, you know, I think it's really important in these last three cases we we're discussing, make it really clear this is a 6-3 court. And occasionally we see defections from, you know, the Chief Justice, from Kavanaugh, from Barrett, sometimes from Neil Gorsuch on Native American. American cases, but to suggest that these are moderates completely elides the problem, which is they are movement conservatives, you know, bought and paid for by the Federalist Society and Leonard Leo and the conservative legal movement that's poured right billions of dollars of dark money into seating them. And to suggest that they are modulating, and I think this is Steve Vladek's great piece in MSNBC today, it's the kind of argument Mark and I made in our piece, oh. is to, to, to totally miss that the cases in which they quote side with the liberals this term are cases that were functionally insane, right? So that's the independent state legislature yeah. theory, something nobody had ever heard of before. Uh, that's the uh, uh, Alabama Merrill v. Milligan case. Insane, right? We're going to get rid of all the existing, whatever's left of Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act, we're throwing it out. So the fact that they didn't do insane things, but end up at the status quo, and that we put that in the column of progressive wins. Right. I keep describing it, and this is me and Victor, but I keep saying like not getting punched in the neck is not a win. Those are <laughs> yes. not getting punched in the neck status quo cases. And as measured against the wins for like revanchist, radical conservative ideas, like we've ended affirmative action. The president can't use the HEROES Act to end student debt. Uh, we can no longer uh, use anti-discrimination law because there's some carve out now for forced speech. That is radical moving of the goalposts. And so I just want us to sort of sit in the fact that the Overton window is changing in front of our eyes. And there's this real temptation to say like, hey, Brett Kavanaugh didn't vote for the single most insane, unprincipled thing in the world. That makes him a hippie? No, that makes him a movement conservative who isn't completely off the rails. Absolutely. I wish we had so much more time to talk deeper about each of those three cases, but I have to have you back on to talk about that. But I do want to talk to you um, about Justice Ketanji Brown Jackson, you have a great book about lady justice and women who have kind of battled and kind of saved America. I, I'm wondering what you think of Ketanji Brown Jackson, this being her first um, term on the court. We saw her really amazing opinion in the affirmative action case. What you think kind of people should take away from her um, time on this court so far and what that says to you about maybe her future impact uh, on this court? I, I mean, the Slightly dispiriting answer is I think she's going to be on the losing side for a long time. And all of the dissents, by the way, in each of the cases we've talked about are you could peel paint amazing. Hers, Justice Kagan's, Justice Sotomayor's. But I think the nut of your question is that she has done something really radical, which is go back to the original purpose, text and meaning of the Reconstruction Amendment. And so when she talks about, no, excuse me. The 14th Amendment was not colorblind. It was not designed to be colorblind. It was not designed to help white people not suffer from racism. She comes at it using the game that the other side has set up, right? This is textualism, originalism, original public meaning. And she kind of mashes it back in their face and says, under no construction of the facts, is this what the framers, the radical abolitionist framers of those amendments were trying to do? So please don't lie. And to have the first Black woman justice, both owning 
you know, that direct link between the Reconstruction Amendments and this moment and saying, like, if you don't understand what it is that they set out to do, then you are deliberately lying. If you use Thurgood Marshall's name or you use Brown v. Board to say that this is what they wanted, then please have enough respect to know that you're not telling the truth. That's a radical project she's doing, and she is doing it so eloquently and so elegantly. It makes me sad that she's on the losing side, but I think having her kind of lift up that argument has been profound, profound yeah. this year. And I think it's going to be profound for younger generations, too, who look at this court with this, at least the people I've talked to, with this kind of skepticism and, and cynical nature, because it is just handing down these opinions that are absurd and, and really kind of roll back rights. And how do you think kind of some of these cases will impact younger generations to come? Um, how is this going to shape our world? I, I, it's one of the reasons I was so happy to come on the show. I think it's it's impossible to not see the student loan forgiveness case and the affirmative action case as of a piece, right? These are both cases that will make it harder for incredibly hard fought rights to have some access to an equal playing field. If you're young, if you're poor, if you're a person of color, right? If you don't have all the advantages, those cases in tandem are hard to see as anything other than a deep, deep disrespect of just core ideas about the ways in which access to education and equal access to education and affordable education are the mechanism, right? The springboard to equality. And there's a carve out in case folks don't don't know in the affirmative action case where the chief justice completely irrelevantly says, okay, we're doing away with all affirmative action in high, yeah. higher education, except the military, because it's right. important there. And I want people to hear what he's saying. Uh, justice Jackson, Katanji Brown Jackson in her dissent essentially says, so you're saying that people of color are necessary in the bunker, but not in the boardroom. I mean, yeah. it is such an affront for young people to be told that there's an urgent necessary need for diversity and equality in the military, but not in education. And I think that that through line of those two cases, and the, maybe the last thing I'll say about this, because I think it's important. I think if last year, the signaling that came out of the Supreme Court at the end of the term was like, we don't much care about how women suffer after Dobbs and pregnant people don't much care about kind of infusing religion into schools, don't care at all about the environment uh, that was right, the, the, the dismantling of environmental protections, and don't care about the massive, massive expansion of gun rights that we've just unloosed on you. And that was horrifying. I think this year, the deep insult of saying we do not care about young people and equal access to education and opportunity is as much a smack in the face as last year's rulings were. Were. It's just directed at young people and particularly young people of color and young people who don't necessarily have economic opportunity. And I think we should take that very seriously as a promise of what's to come from this court. Absolutely. What, what do you think we should be doing right now to respond to this court? What are some of the most important things we can do? I mean, it feels hopeless at times, like you said, but how can we kind of find hope in this moment? What gives you hope? I mean, there are two things that give me hope. One is, I think, two years ago, when we were having the conversation about public approval of the court, uh, you know, the numbers were, right, they were pretty good, way better than the yeah. other branches of government. I think that Dobbs and Bruin, the gun case, and these cases have massively changed the conversation about public trust in the court. And that has, you know, over and above that, we've seen the flagrant ethics violations from Clarence Thomas and Samuel Alito, right? Billions of dollars undisclosed in gifts, in travel, in, you know, buying Clarence Thomas's mama house, right? All that is happening in plain sight. And the message we've received from the court time and time again is not your business, not your problem. We're the king, you know go away. And so I think that what we're seeing now is this huge enthusiasm for a conversation about term limits, uh -huh. about thinking about adding seats to the court, about all the ways in which we have to get out from under this sort of dead hand of Donald Trump's justices. And the people who are leading this conversation, unsurprisingly, are young people who just clocked the Clean Water Act case that came out of the court a few weeks ago and are saying no, are young people who care about unions and organizing, who clock 
o'clock that the court this year again undermined the ability for unions to organize. So I think there's a straight line between, as I said, young people who are most affected by these decisions and a meaningful conversation about reforming the court and not living like this for the next 30 years. Yeah. And I suspect the young people also know that that conversation and, and, and kind of seeing the fruits of that conversation happen won't be possible without voting. And I think a lot of young voters are going to turn out in 2024. Um, Dahlia, thank you so much for joining me today and talking about the Supreme Court and, and giving us just a little bit of glimmer of hope, um, even though all the news has been bad. But thank you for all that you do. Thank you for what you do. Thanks for having me. Of course. Thanks so much. Well, Dahlia Lithwick is so powerful and, and is able to contextualize this court and put it into um, you know, a way that we can all understand. And I think that's kind of the most important thing right now is making sure that we have clarity of what these decisions will do in our lives, what this court is. Um, it's not a 3-3-3 three, three, three court. It is a 6-3 court that is kind of producing these opinions that are more extreme, more radical. And that's something that everyone should understand in clear terms. Um, and we shouldn't pretend otherwise that it's some 3-3-3 three, three, three court with, you know, justices in the middle who are willing to preserve the court. It is fundamentally a 6-3 court. And Dahlia Lithwick um, writes about it so well and speaks about it so well wherever she is. Um, I highly recommend her if you um, want to learn more about her, if you want to uh, follow her work, follow her on Slate. She produces articles uh, very, very frequently. Today, she wrote one uh, on the Roberts court and why this is his court and all of, and he's the only person who is winning and the rest of us are losing. She also, like I said, has written this great book called Lady Justice about um, women who have shaped and defined kind of the law and has have really kind of moved our culture in significant ways. And she's also the co-host of uh, the Amicus podcast. So follow her uh, there if you want to listen to more Supreme Court analysis and um, breakdowns of all of these different laws. So uh, she is amazing and she's so powerful, and I'm grateful that she joined me today. Um, today is obviously the day before 4th of July, which means that tomorrow um, I will be taking 4th of July off. Uh, so for those of you who are eager to watch the show tomorrow, uh, I will not be here, but I will be back Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday of this week with great guests. So don't miss those. Uh, I'll be back at 6 p.m. Pacific, 3 p.m. East, or, sorry, sorry, 6 p.m. Eastern, 3 p.m. Pacific, right here on youtube.com slash Politicon or on my Twitter page at VictorShe2020. Again, it's 6 p.m. Eastern, 3 p.m. Pacific, right here on youtube.com slash Politicon or on Twitter. You can like and subscribe so you don't miss an episode. Uh, have a great 4th of July. You know, if you have any festivities, if you're watching fireworks, I hope you enjoy. Have a safe and lovely 4th of July, and uh, I will see you all on Wednesday. <laughs>